Hello everyone and welcome to my studio at UNC Pembroke. I'm glad to have you back with me. Today we're going to talk about clarity. As brass players and as tuba and euphonium players specifically, this is the third video now in my series of what I am calling the basics of brass playing, which I think of as tone, rhythm, clarity, and flow. So here we are today on clarity. What does that even mean? When we talk about clarity on a brass instrument, most of us feel like we're talking about tonguing specifically. And there's a lot of great material on YouTube now about articulating and the tongue. I wanted to think about more where that goes wrong today. Some aspects for us to keep in mind for clarity in addition to understanding the physical nature of what's happening with our tongue when we're tonguing. And I've divided it into three goals. We're gonna understand, execute, and adjust. For clarity, I think the biggest thing, on tuba especially, but on euphonium also, is this understanding. So what we need to do is we need to understand clarity as a series of options, not simply one thing. We're adjusting, that's the understand, adjust. We're adjusting clarity constantly in all situations. And sometimes I see that that's not as successful. What does it take to understand, especially on tuba, which is so different, the clarity and the articulation concerns that we might have as players? The first thing for understanding is that we often have a previous bias. Maybe we started on a different instrument. This is especially common on tuba, to start on another instrument first and then be moved to tuba. And a previous bias about what it takes to tongue and slur cleanly on the tuba the tuba is the most different. This clarity is an area where the euphonium and tuba differ a good bit. Probably they differ the most in the four areas that I'll be talking about in this series as far as clarity. Understanding a previous bias that you might have, because for tuba especially, the tonguing and slurring clarity, the articulating, comes from what I am going to call a strong forward energy. A forward energy. We're not using terms like force, but we're saying forward energy. There is more strength in the articulation on tuba than many people realize when they pick up the instrument. And so if we're off on clarity, it tends to be that we're off because we're not strong enough. Clarity is enunciating. It is speaking to your audience through your tonguing and slurring. The mechanics of what you're saying on the instrument has to come through to the audience. And that may be grandma in the back row. This understanding the goal is very first thing. Before we even get out our music stand, let's understand what's happening. So previous bias could be keeping us from this forward energy that we need. It's a strong spitting action. We talk about this with our beginners. It needs to be strong. That's why mouthpiece buzzing, I think, is a big help to this. In some of my other videos, I talked about other things that come in here. Posture, breathing, a daily fundamental routine, of course. This bias, though, you might be doing all of that, but just doing it more gently than the tuba requires. That strong spitting action. Another thing is that we, I want you to accept that there are multiple ways. There's multiple ways to do many things, and articulating on the tuba and euphonium is one of them. Don't get stuck in a rut that you're trying to do a particular thing. Experiment. Try multiple ways. Something might hit it for you. The tuba mouthpiece is gigantic. Compared to all the other brass instruments, our mouths are different sizes. And the amount of freedom that we have in the tuba mouthpiece is much greater than our other brass colleagues in the orchestra or the concert band have. And multiple ways really can come into play for us. Be open to try new things with your clarity and your articulation. Syllables is another thing. We like to use the ta or toe in low brass, and this is different. Again, multiple ways. Whatever works for you, if you sound great, it doesn't matter what syllable you use, does it? However, most of the time we want to sound better, and in the tuba euphonium world, we tend to use ta and to. The note has three parts that can give us trouble when we're recording and, and when we're playing. The front, the middle, and the end. And the front of the note is what we're talking about when we use words like attack, and clarity, articulate. Those words are often meaning the front of the note. And this is where we get that ta, the ta or to. 
In low brass, we tend to like that open throat, as I mentioned in the tone video. When we're using syllables like ta and to, those keep the throat more open, which is essential on tuba and euphonium. Some, on euphonium, some other syllables might come in. We use oo sounds in the upper brass, brass a good bit. Do, gu, those are more closed mouth, and those work great for some registers. And e sounds as well, which widen us, e. This syllable use, again, multiple ways. Don't get stuck in a rut of, I have to use the one syllable. If it doesn't sound good, try a different syllable. I tend to start with ta and to as syllables. So if the first area for us to understand articulation and clarity is the sense of what's going on in our brain, how are we envisioning the motions, how are we thinking about it, if that's the first step, the next step is the execution. And this is what's on our stand, what are we doing in our daily routine to make sure that we are clearly enunciating to the audience. Clarity and things like tonguing and how, how hard or soft your tongue and all of that Think of it like stage makeup. When we put on stage makeup in theater, we are overdoing it close up so that it can be seen from far away. And this period of time when we spend in our practice, we need to practice a range of articulations and a range of clarity. It's not one tongue for a particular excerpt or solo. It is a range based on many other things. And your audience is one of them. So I like the idea of thinking of it as stage makeup we might put on lighter makeup in certain situations, but if we're playing at the Met, let's put on that darker eyeliner and draw in those wrinkles and really over enunciate for the audience. That's what we need to do in our practice, in our stand, in here. This studio is a nice size studio, but I tell my students that if we're practicing in here and it sounds a little unmatched for the space in here, maybe it sounds too short for this space, then we'll be perfect when we get into the band room at jury time or in the auditorium for the department area recital. But if they don't practice the different ways, it's not gonna work out. Here we have a practice checklist. These are the things we need to do to make sure that we have that range of clarity. We're executing everything we can do to communicate to that audience. The first thing is, let's practice slurring clarity. We tend to think of articulating as tonguing, but the clarity in our slur is just as important. We have traditions of using singing books like Kankone and the Roshu book that we may all have on our music stands. That is, of course, lyrical playing. It's great for many things, and one of them is clear slurring. Those books, tongue followed by slur, tongue followed by slur. We need to shift that. Another thing we find in that is the valve slurring versus lip slurring. When notes are in the overtone series and have to be transferred, that usually you can tell that when it's not a valve slur. The valve slurs tend to be more smooth, so working on both in our practice routine. The next would be that we would need to do tonguing, obviously. Koprash, Arbin, Terrell, these books are great for tonguing. Again, in all scenarios, from your, your driest, shortest staccato, all the way up to your most lyrical legato playing. And those books are great for putting us into scenarios and situations. You want to be working on tongue and slur in combination, making sure that you can switch. And then you want to make sure that you're working in all registers and all keys and major and minor and all of that. And then of course, genre, the genre changes how we would articulate back to understanding. We need to understand what the genre expects of us. Jazz articulation is different than we would play our Wagner tuba excerpts. Thinking about that and really listening and looking for style and then practicing it and working on it. I found a great example for this section in the Terrell book on euphonium. This one is such a sweet one. It's a largo in C minor. So right there we have two things that we wouldn't expect in a tonguing book, right? This minor and a slower tempo gives a sweetness to it. And then we have sixteenths, we have slur and tongue in combination, we have staccatos, we have various accents. This Tyrell is one of my favorite ones to play, and I found it quite difficult as I was preparing this one to play for you today to make sure that I got clarity when it switched patterns. So switching patterns is one of the most important things to put on our music stands. We need to be able to come, if we're doing slur two, we might say toho, toho, toho in our articulated syllables, but what if it goes ta ha ha, ta ta ha ha, ta. 
or tiata. Those are where I tend to miss. After the pattern gets begun, then it changes, and I will miss that. Where the fingers go. Fingers is another aspect of what we're working on. These finger patterns and how we're comfortable going in and out of the fourth vowel, for example. So that's a perfect one for euphonium because the C minor key in this Tyrell gives us a chance to execute that fourth finger. In Tyrell number 13, one of the things that I love the most about this is that we have a beautiful eighth note melody with grace notes. It has sixteenths and ties in combination. This is a great rhythm workout for us. And it's somewhat low. It utilizes the fourth vowel because we have one and two in combination with four, that C being our tonic, as well as the low F sharp for the seven of five, the F sharp G in C minor, right? So what's on our stand is such a huge part of this articulating. We have to be ready for all scenarios. And one of the things that I notice is if students are worried about their solo performances as university students, they tend to only practice them, and they tend to lighten the time they spend in the etude books, the practice books that we have. This is dangerous because your piece is only probably in one or two keys, and it's maybe only in one articulation pattern and one time signature. The books, if we're doing a new Coprash every week or a new Terrell every week, we've spent this week together on number 13 in C minor, but the next week might be a different one, and so we'll have to adjust. This sense of leaving the books to the side is an important one to watch. We don't want to leave those experiences for later. We want to make sure we can do them now. I think that working in those A2 books, those practice books, makes the solo better without you even having to touch it because you're more used to that range of clarity and that range of articulation that we're talking about. Again, looking at where the spaces are that we're going to be playing the notes, as we'll talk about in a minute. We're looking at slurring and tonguing. And then we're looking at them in combination. We're looking at elements like grace notes, trills, the ornaments, and how we get out of them safe and alive after we play them through. We're looking at fingers. I like to think of the fingers as this circle because my eyes see the note that triggers the finger and I'm tonguing. I need to make sure the valves go down first. And on tuba, again, longer throw. So this is something that we see slow fingers getting in the way, that, that path between eyes, finger, tongue and that breathing, and that continues on that path. Such an important thing to practice so that we can do that. If our breathing hitches because we're nervous, we need to make sure that that tonguing finger circle is active. My next example for you of how to think about what's on your stand for clarity and articulation comes from the Koprash book, one of my very favorites, annoying us all for several hundred years. And this one is number 23. It's in the key of D major in the tuba book, and that means fingers are going to be a problem. We have this coming in and out of fourth, as well as the C sharp being on one and two, or two and four, and the fifth A being one and two. One and two and two and three, right, that seven of five, the G sharp A, hate that fingering, two and three, hate it. <laughs> two and three and one and two, really annoying. And what we do is we don't get through it again. We're not understanding, remember, forward energy not force, but forward energy, relaxed power. We're striking strong on the attack so that we can get through all that tubing, especially on tuba. Coprash 23 in the key of D has a two octave range from the low A to the high, as well as slur to tongue to. For the most part, the pattern does change. So we're going to ho, to, to, to ho, to, to. We're really trying to come out of the slur. Remember, the notes have the start, the middle, and the end. And that end of the to ho, cutting off that slur, then going to to for the two tongues, they're staccato. So that makes another addition. This exercise has a different dynamic in every bar. We have piano, mezzo forte, and forte. There are crescendos, there are decrescendos, all sorts of things in this one. One of the best ones for us outside of our favorite keys. That's so important. We need to make sure that we're ready to go on all of the keys. So this one, I really struggled making sure that I could come in after, say, there's, there's an eighth note and then an eighth note rest so as to make the breath, and then coming in, but maybe you're in a different register. Each line of this changes register. So you might be used to clearly articulating and you've got your pattern going and you're all right because you were below the staff. But then he comes up and he starts us on the D in the staff, and then we're backing off in the upper register, making sure that we don't overblow. 
That's one of the things that I work on on euphonium. Euphonium is my secondary instrument. My bias then, right? Remember in the beginning we talked about understanding our bias. My bias comes from tuba. If you have trouble on tuba, probably need to blow a little more energetically. If you do that on euphonium, it's all a mess. I need to make sure that I come back and that I'm a little more gentle on the euphonium. I tend to overblow. In this one, one of the things we notice is it's easy to be late. We're trying so hard to tongue cleanly, that spitting action we talked about, that it's easy to be late. We don't want to be late, we want to be right on time. It started out for horn, so it's more demanding than sometimes tuba rep can be. And that's our secret weapon. <laughs> let's steal the rep from everybody else. Let's steal Arvin. Let's steal Coprash. Let's play Charlier. Let's do those that were meant for the instruments that get to have the melody that were seen as needing to be more flexible. Our clarity being that range of options, having us really have a sense of how to throw that energy, how to put our stage makeup on when we're out there so that that grandma in the back row can hear us clearly. If we don't execute it every day in our fundamentals, we're not going to have it when it counts. When we get that moment in the sun, we're understanding what to do and then we're promising to get in the chair every single day and execute. Now the last part of our story for today is adjusting. We've understood, we've executed. But then we get to the gig, we get to the performance, or we're sitting down and we're making a recording. We need to adjust. Understanding, executing, and adjusting. Adjusting for balance, adjusting for volume, adjusting for the forcefulness that we were using. And that depends so much on the scenario. Let's keep a list of things in mind. What affects our clarity and what makes us have to adjust? One of them are things like spaces. We, we talked about that, this idea that what sounds too short in this room is going to be just right for the larger spaces. Where we're playing our concerts are usually not where we're practicing. And that's important. We need to make sure to change. Don't forget that for tuba and euphonium, your bell is at your ears. Unlike some of the other brass, horn players might feel comfortable too because their bell's at their ear. Trumpet and trombone, they're sending that sound out. Our bell is at our ear. We don't know what it sounds like out there. We only know what it sounds like here, and that can bias us. The spaces that we play in, how do we know how we sound out there for grandma? We have to record it, or we have to send someone out there <laughs> to tell us, hey, it needs to be shorter, which is usually the case. We need to experiment in the spaces that we're playing in and adjust. We also need to adjust when we're playing with pianists based on the stick tend to use full stick as low brass players, depending on the kind of player you are and your understanding of that forward energy, that strength and the spitting motion, you might need to project with a little more front, a little more attack, so that you can have that full stick behind you for a jury or an area recital in an auditorium. The piano, the piano stick. Other things are things like mutes and bell covers now that we're using that might adjust our clarity. Remember, it's a range. There isn't one staccato, there isn't one accent per dynamic. There's a range of them at all dynamics. Then we're playing with people, other people. It's really wonderful when we get to do that. Orchestras and bands. The range of clarity in an orchestra is going to vary entirely on who you are as a tubist. Who are you? Are you with the basses? Are you playing as part of the bassoon section right then? Or are you with the trombones? Maybe you're with the horns. They might be over on the other side of the stage in their block. Maybe you're a fifth horn right then. That's all going to adjust how you think of your range of clarity, as well as what the conductor wants from you, where you are. You want a riser. Are you not? Also, chamber music. In a brass quintet, for example, you're of course going to take your articulated work from the trumpets, leading, and they might want to take it from you if you have something like in West Side Story where you might be setting style a little more than usual for some brass quintet arrangements. Let's make sure that you really get in there and showcase the style for the group as well. But we do have that traditional thought that the high brass leads us. In the euphonium ensemble though, 
this is when we really get to come into our own. And I want to make sure that all of us get a chance to do that as much as possible, to be a phoneme quartet and to be a phoneme ensemble. So the example I chose for us for an ensemble idea to get us thinking about that range of clarity is a tuba quartet piece. It's tuba two of the four by Portia Nijoku, and it's called Fanfare for a King, Martin Luther King in this case. She has a set, one of them is called Elegy for a King, and that's more slow, more lyrical, and this is a fanfare. And at letter B in this fanfare, tuba two gets to shine. I decided to play it for you on F tuba because it is in the staff. And one of the reasons I chose it is because this is an example of a piece in, in a, an ensemble piece, a part where it's actually quite difficult. She's asking us for a mezzo forte. So not my loudest dynamic. I can really zing it on the F tuba in the upper register, right? But mezzo forte is not the time. However, it is accented and there's triple tonguing. I chose this because there's a lot going on. There's the one, two fingering because it's A's. Then there's two, four because there's F sharps. There's quarter note triplets, as well as a good octave or more register. Mezzo forte, but with crescendos and accents. And these triple tonguing triplets need to be crisp. I'm playing this here in the studio today, but I'm imagining that I would be playing it like that in rehearsal with a group, maybe four, or as an ensemble on my concert hall stage. And I need to give that forward energy and that spinning. I need it to have a little more front. Ta, 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 ta. I really need to make sure that enunciates. I have my stage makeup on. I need to make sure that I can get heard in that back row with this melody. So this piece is a great example of how in your ensemble playing, you can find things that make you shine and that have you give you that practice to adjust. <laughs> So we understood, we executed all over the place, got our butt in the chair, we practiced and we put that stand checklist on our music stand. Now though, we're out in the world and we're always constantly adjusting. We're adjusting for balance based on lots of different things, as we said, based on mutes and bell covers and based on this, the reminder that the bell is by our ear, we're not hearing what's out there. If we're in a church, if we're in an auditorium, maybe a classroom that's that's got a linoleum floor, all of these things come into play. Before we finish today, I wanted to say a small word about another aspect of clarity for us as tuba and euphonium players, and that is recording. Recording is such a daily part of our world now. This sense of making sound files that we then email as auditions and for conference acceptance and for competitions and this is now all electronic and so many of us are struggling with learning this learning curve of, of where to put the mics and what kind of things we're going to do to the sound and I want us to be aware to watch the reverb. This is something that's come now that we all have this ability to just turn it up. That we lose clarity when we do that, and it does sound round, and, and I know that that feels desirable, but be careful in a competition, for example, maybe you're sending a, uh, for the ITEA competitions or Falcone or things like that, watch that you don't do yourself a disservice in the area of your clarity by how you're recording. Make sure that yourself, your enunciating, comes through in that tape, <laughs> the audition tape, that you need to hear that clarity. The pieces are chosen so wisely. Falcone, for example, this year it used Bach, and we had Elizabeth Raum, and both of those were tongue and slur in combination quite a bit. That's the killer. Those different keys and different registers. And what we hear is if you turn the reverb up or your mics are in a funny spot, we don't get that clarity of the slurring and then switching to the tonguing, or going up high and then coming low, a leap. That's a real good place to lose clarity is after a leap. That's why we put Bach on all the auditions. Bach does that to us all the time. So as, as we wrap up today, we're thinking about these aspects of clarity and how we envision this as tuba and euphonium players. Please watch how you're putting your best foot forward on the recording stage. And that gets you there live, and then you can sound amazing when you're there live in the final rounds. Let's, let's try to get those final rounds in. And today, one of the things that I want you to take away is that it's a range of ideas. It is not just one thing all the time. Really experiment and come into your own. Your lips on the mouthpiece are different than mine. My jaw motion is different than yours. And let's make sure that we're allowing that experimentation. 
Don't be set in a bias. Allow yourself the chance to think about what could be. Try things. Then execute them. See if they're better. Then adjust. You're going to record. You're going to listen back. Oh, that was too much. I need to be softer. I'm going to try that. Oh, that's too soft. I lost my clarity. Go back and forth. Listen to yourself. Be honest with the results you're getting. Listen to your stars. They're all doing this too. All your favorite players. I hope you have good luck with your clarity as you move forward in this journey of us in the chair every day trying to contribute to the, the world of the arts and trying to make people happy with the music that we play and the very best possible way we can. I thank you for joining me today in studio. I hope you stay well and I'll see you here soon. Take care.